Good morning. This is Meg Riley in wet, rainy, believe it or not, Minneapolis, Minnesota, where the snow is melting fast and everyone has leaky basements. So far, not me, happily. Good morning, everyone. You might notice that we're a rather white group this morning for ourselves. I wanted to acknowledge that Marga Lee and Christina and Asia are all at Finding Our Way Home in Miami, and we're taking the opportunity to talk about how white folks can be allies on the journey. I'll introduce our special guest in just a minute, but first I'd like our regulars to check in. And Dawn, you're a regular for this month. Welcome, how are you today? I am well, thanks. Um, I am Dawn Fortune. I serve our congregation at the UU Congregation of the South Jersey Shore um, in Galloway, New Jersey, south actually of the Mason-Dixon line and some days it shows. Um, Things here are doing well. Spring is here. I've got crocuses in my yard. Um, you know, we're starting to look at the wet leaves and think we're going to do something about those. Um, but life is good. Michael, how are you this morning? I'm doing well. Thank you, Don. This is Michael Tino for joining you from Peekskill, New York, um, where, where the crocuses are also blooming. It is a wonderful thing. Those of you who know me, like, so Meg, you're probably the only person who's been on The View with me during uh, for cro crocus day um knows that the first crocus blooming in my yard is my new year that is like my new year's day it is a, a sacred holiday here in peekskill and um for some reason my crocuses in my south facing urban yard always bloom about three weeks before anybody else's do around here so i make sure Michael, to has your daughter picked up on this holiday is um it not quite as you know, she's not quite as excited about it, about it as I am. She is, she is um, learning to figure out how to spell crocus. That is her thing now. She, you know, she's she's sounding out the sounds in the word crocus and deciding which letters they must be. So that is our excitement here, and I'm encouraging that. That's great. And this morning we have both on tech and as a host, Lori Stone Sertoski. Lori. Don't don't bore us with how warm and balmy it is there in Phoenix. I get a little tired of it, frankly. <laughs> okay. I can understand that. It's sunny today. I'll say that. Uh, I I my name is Lori Stone Sertoski. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, hailing from the Southwest. Uh, my uh, I'm teasing. You get to brag. You'll have the <laughs> summer to whine. <laughs> well. It's been in the 50s here lately. We get a lot of, we've gotten a lot of rain this last week. So, and so that's great because my grass is actually green and I have grass. And so that's kind of cool. Uh, I am also going to be over on Twitter and uh, monitoring the comments on our Facebook uh, live chat. So I'll be passing questions and comments into the host chat so that anybody who wants to interact with the host today, just go ahead and join us over on Facebook Live on our CLFUU page. And we will uh, make sure that those comments get transferred into the uh, live uh, feed here of The View. That's great, thank you. So I'm excited that we have a special guest today, Dr. Sharon Welch. Sharon is a senior fellow with the Institute for Humanist Studies and is a longtime member of the UU Peace Ministry Network. She also served as provost and professor of religion and society at Meadville Lombard for over 10 years. And before that, she was in um, Missouri and at Harvard, and she's written six books. And we're gonna talk to her today about her latest book. It's called After the Protests Are Heard, Enacting Civil Engagement and Social Transformation. Welcome, Sharon. Where are you and how is it there? Okay, well, I, I, I'm in Chicago and um, spring is far away, except we are in this most amazing, amazing political thing. I've never experienced this in my entire life. We have a mayoral race coming up April 2nd, and it's a the runoff. And the two candidates are both progressive African-American women. And one of them is um, you're you, Tony Preckwinkle, that I um, interview in the book. And I have never in my life been in this kind of political race. And so I feel like it's as big as having I mean, this kind of race is exciting as crocus is blooming. I mean, it just gives me a sense of what's possible. What's possible. Love it. 
That's great. That's fabulous. Well, let's start. You wrote this book. You've written a number of others that we've read and loved over the years. I'm curious, what, what took you here to enacting civic engagement? What, you know, what, that's not the sexiest thing you could have written about. So you, you, it's a very nuts and bolts book about how to do this stuff, uh, especially if you have access to some privilege. So how'd you get there? Well, one of the things that I, that I found myself doing is, is this juxtaposition. Like I think uh, in, a, in, in some ways it's related to what I see in our mayoral race in Chicago is this bizarre juxtaposition is there are so many people doing these incredibly constructive things for social justice, for racial justice, for economic justice, environmental sustainability. I mean, so much, you know, Paul Hawken in his book, um, Blessed Unrest, actually says we're in the largest social movement in history. And it's not really named, it's not covered well, it's people redefining things in very constructive ways. And I've been involved in that for years. And then at the same time, this rise in authoritarianism, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, xenophobia. And, you know, I, I, I was one of those people where um, with the election and re-election of President Obama, I mean, I never thought we were in a post-racial society. I knew there was so much we needed to do in terms of structural racism and systemic um, racism and implicit bias. But I mean, I'm going to have to admit, I can be honest with you. I really did think there's a threshold below which we would not go. I did not think we would have someone like uh, Stephen Bannon say, let them call you a racist, be proud of it. I didn't think we would see neo-Nazis. I didn't think we would see clans and the explosion of violence, discovering the violence that's been there in the police for decades, but then more um, public violence has been unleashed. And so I dove into the research on authoritarianism and what leads to its rise. And I found this startling, really, uh, the juxtaposition wasn't so odd. There's a relationship between the two, an intrinsic relationship between all of this progress and this resurgence of explicit, evil, white identity politics. And so what I wanted to do in this book is not only write about it in terms of theory, but, and this is the last thing that I want to say right now, is provide with it concrete guides on how it is to act in response. And in doing that, I was, I was inspired by one of the most, most powerful projects one of our students ever did was by Linda Sutherland. And she's now a minister, UU minister at the church in Northboro. And we have our students, when they work in congregations, help the congregations move in crossing boundaries of some sort of race, of gender, of class. And she was in a congregation that wasn't ready to do that at all. So she created this curriculum called the Crossing Boundaries Passport, a journey of discovery. And it was asking people at very beginning levels of how you begin to think about issues and then how you embody them in your daily life. And so what I've done in this book, and this is something that I've never done before, in addition to the theoretical analysis, I worked with Linda. So we interviewed people who are actually doing the work. And what we have accompanying it, which is also freestanding, is a guidebook for just living concrete ways in which we can use our power for justice. So you say in the book that ideology doesn't get you to effective action. So do you want to talk about what does get us to effective action and how you've seen yeah. effective action actually move people? One of the things that I loved, and I'm going to pull this um, up here so, so you can have it, is it was so much fun. And this is this, the uh, social scientist geek in me and the social ethicist is I've always practiced um, nonviolence. And one of the things that I learned in terms of nonviolence early on from working with Gene Sharp, and this was in the late 70s, early 80s in the nuclear freeze campaign. And Gene Sharp is one who has 198 steps for nonviolence. It was very important both in um, the nuclear weapons freeze campaign. His work has been very important in the resistance in Bosnia and Serbia. And also when people talked about the Arab Spring and seemed to be surprised by that explosion, well, people who had really studied it found out that that didn't just emerge from nowhere. There were groups that had been studying Gene Sharp. 
the steps of nonviolent action. And so I was delighted to find that there was this wonderful book, and I'm going to um, show it, and I highly recommend it, called Why Civil Resistance Works, the Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And this is written by two women, Erica Chinowith and Maria Stefan, and they're political scientists. And what they did is they studied every single resistance movement from 1900 to 2006. And so it ends before uh, the Arab Spring. And what's so amazing, everyone, that they found that uh, it's not just that nonviolence is morally uh, compelling, but it is more effective than violence. And what they found that was really interesting, and this is what I loved as a lifelong activist, is uh, this wonderful paradox that what makes nonviolence more effective, and this gets into your question of effective social action, is also what leads to its failure. Before you, before you go on, I just, I'm aware that we're talking white today. So yeah. a lot of white people that I know think of nonviolence as waiting for change to happen. <laughs> what? You know, kind of like, well, don't be violent by agitating or oh lifting up conflict. So can you just talk about nonviolent resistance for a minute? Oh, well, if you look at, non I mean, again, anyone who thinks that look at the 198 steps, because basically what nonviolence is, it's twofold. It's not cooperating with evil as well as instituting forms of justice. I mean, it's not nonviolence. It isn't sitting on the side and saying, I wish. It's action, nonviolent action. And that's really clear. Now, one of the things that is um, so exciting about all of this, and again, I wanted to get the things. And so they're looking at active movements. And one of the things that, that, that they found so profound is what makes, okay, resistance doesn't stop nonviolent movements, I mean, no, repression. And in fact, 80% of nonviolent movements experience repression and actually repression usually backfires and it makes the movement stronger. The way nonviolence, strategic nonviolence fails is its strength because nonviolence is more effective when there is a variety of forms of action. When it's from low, low risk to high risk. So it's not just people doing sit-ins and die-ins and being arrested. It's people calling their, um, their representative. It, it's people talking to their neighbors and having, having dinners. It's people um, not only refusing to cooperate with unjust systems, but for example, part of the reason why the Black Panthers were so success, successful was in many ways what they did was nonviolent which was the before school breakfast programs and the after school tutoring. And so you're not only refusing to cooperate with the system that you find is unjust, you're creating the system that is just. And what leads to dissipation is when people wind up um, wasting their time fighting over which of these actions are the most important rather than figuring how to keep them all in creative resonance with each other. Well, thank God we don't do that anymore. Oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> never, never. No, never. There just uh -uh, isn't a moment lost in that. Uh -uh. That, no. is, that is uh, maybe affirming to people who, who are, seem to be crying for one tactic all the time um, or one, one way forward. Um, maybe, yeah. that could, maybe that could be liberating to, to know it's that all of the paths it is profoundly liberating, too, to realize you need some people to run for office and you need some people to do sit-ins and die-ins. And quite often, it's not the same people, right? But the, those juxtapositions, and I've learned some of that, too, from um, the, the kind of wisdom of this when I was director of women's studies at the University of Missouri, because I was hired by Casey Morrison, African-American political scientist who had studied the civil rights movement. And I remember the first semester that I was there, he um, was describing how odd it was to be in this position because he was involved in making all of these systemic changes and yet students were sitting in protesting in his office. And he said it, he had the joy and in some ways like of using their protest to get the leverage to get done what he wanted to get from the board, right? Now his power wasn't sitting in in somebody else's office. He was writing the new policies that provided the kind of support that students 
needed, which is in addition, not just um, financial support, but training and stopping microaggressions, getting the kind of advising that they needed, but how those two things, um, they're both equally needed the protest and the policy actions, hence after the protests are heard, I, and respond to the protest. I remember when Obama was elected, he said, you have to make me do the right things. It won't happen unless you make me. And mm -hmm. I look back at all the energy that's been yeah. unleashed to protest Trump, and I look at the things that frankly, I let Obama do without mm -hmm. enough protest around mm -hmm. deportations, around drones, around other things, that, um, you know, really, I was so relieved to have the previous administration out of office that I was way too passive in hindsight. And I wonder if we had demanded, you know, what we might have accomplished or if there would have been an even bigger backlash if we'd been even more effective. Because obviously, on many fronts, everything that was done is being undone now. So I don't know. Well, kind of well, two responses on that. I mean, one, I think both. I, I agree with you completely. And um, and and this was also something that uh, Machiavelli realized is that we don't do as much in terms of public action supporting the positive changes, right? And so it's like when Machiavelli talked about um, the worst thing for a prince is trying to introduce a new order of things because those who have done well under the old will fight you like demons, and those who may do well will support wholeheartedly. So we also didn't do enough to support what would have been major changes in um, health care. We got something, but there could have been more. We didn't do enough to support the other things. And so that um, making do it applies to the positive and not just the negative. I, I, I think what I have seen, um, and I think it's wonderful to have somebody really smart say what I've been thinking in a fancy book. Um, <clears throat> and what I've been observing is since the 1980s, liberals, progressives, political and religious, um, have cut off our fringes. Mm. And um, the conservatives have empowered theirs because the fringes, if you look at the Republican party, say of the 1970s and 80s, Nixon gave us OSHA, the Clean Water Act and a bunch of Clean Air Act and a bunch of other stuff. Like what, right? And so he couldn't run as a Democrat today because he'd be laughed at as to the left of say Bernie and Dennis Kucinich. Yeah. Um, and in our effort to reach the middle, we keep, we speaking for myself, white progressives or more like you white progressives keep moving further to the right yeah. um, where it turns out that I, who wasn't anything particularly radical in the 1980s, am suddenly the outlier radical saying, hello, excuse me, does nobody pay any attention to this? Um, you know, when we're all pining for the days of George Bush Sr., because that seemed reasonable, and I feel like some days I'm the only one that remembers that he ran the CIA for Nixon. So like we have compromised so much that we have become who we used to fight against. Well, one of the things that I find is a real challenge in this, um, you know, it builds on in a slight, you know, slightly different angle, like with, with Chandler with, and Stefan, is that how you keep together the both really radical and the mainstream in realizing what is the resonance of the kind of beloved community of pluralistic democracy and what it is that you're working on. And one of the things that you do that is you have more people then be able to come involved and you can get at levers of power, but it's from a place of integrity, not from just going to the center at all. You need everything across the age. And one of the things, um, one of the things that's, that's really interesting about in, in this book, I mean, they're saying you need both 
again, things where people who aren't that radical can be involved, but you need the most radical and you need to support it and you need to honor it. And I love the honesty of, again, po political scientists, because while they're saying that strategic nonviolence is the most effective, I mean, it's, you know, hands down, the data is there. Um, sometimes even a violent fringe helps and sometimes it hurts. The data is inconclusive, you know, so, so they can't say either way. The only thing is that it has to be a fringe, right? If it becomes the mainstream, there's more likely to be failure. Um, I mean, the data's open. Like where would we be on HIV AIDS research without ACT UP? Yeah, exactly. Without, without Queer Nation, without somebody sure. being rude to Catholic bishops and cardinals. Um, that, that was nonviolent direct action, right? Yeah. Mm, depends on who you're, who, which side of it, 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 it. They were they were throwing things at religious leaders. Blood. Uh, yeah. There are some who would say that's not nonviolent. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it's interesting to me how people fight about what's nonviolent. I mean, there were like highway shutdowns are violent because an ambulance couldn't get to hospitals. And, you know, so when you say a violent fringe, Sharon, what are you talking about? Um, this would be destruction of property and destruction of life. So, yeah. And, but, but again, what it's, and again, what, what they're saying is that you need the range. All right. And so it like, and if it's all on the violent thing that you don't get as much of the change as you have people who also sit down and do the neighborhood calls and call the policy. It's like, again, people get involved um, where their gifts are. So I just wanted to acknowledge that we have people watching from Germany and from Canada, mm -hmm. as well as uh, people all over the US. And um, that's exciting. And we always love to bring in international points of view on this. So um, all comments are welcome. So Sharon, what, what, I mean, I'll just say, I know Sharon well, and she, I can always ask her about research. You know, I am a minister, I live by anecdotes, and often I will say, well, anecdotally, and she'll say, well, the research absolutely contradicts your anecdotal <laughs> experience. And it's very useful for me to know the research without having to read all those pesky long books that Sharon reads. But if you, I do think um, reading is also important. And so if you, this is maybe for later in the show, maybe for now, if you had three books that mm -hmm. you thought particularly white folks in the U.S. should read, right. what would those be? Or books that have most informed what you know about how to move forward? Okay, um, I'll get to that. But one, a quick aside, one of the things, and especially highlighting with an international audience, one of the things I, I wanted to lift up is the range of campaigns that Shinoweth and Stefan look at, um, it includes the 1931 resistance in Chile, um, the people power movement in the Philippines, um, the singing revolution in Estonia, 1989. And one of the things that's really interesting, they get into the difference between the anti-apartheid campaigns in South Africa and the one that failed from 52 to 61 and then the successful one to 84 and 94. And of course, what's also interesting about the um, people power is that while it was successive then, it's also been undone now. Right. And, and so looking at that. And, and so again, the um, books. Yeah, one of the things that, and again, this is focusing um, specifically and acknowledging an international audience, but what I have what I found absolutely essential, and it's in light of, what has happened in the United States, our particular form of rise of authoritarianism and this explosion of explicit white identity, white violence is really delving deeply into two things. And one of course is um, what was done to the indigenous populations of the United States. And one of the books that's so important there is Philip Deloria and in his work, what he describes is how systematically um, Europeans coming into the United States took spiritual power from indigenous people while exercising political and economic power over them. So taking these kind of symbols of you know, spirituality, but while destroying the people and how that's done. And I think it's um, very important. 
Um, uh, it, it, and it, and it, so it's, it's really essential, I think, to, to dive into those histories and how it was justified. S something else, and I've really been diving into it again, I do think the dad, and if anyone knows the dad on this, I, I would really like to get it because one of the things that surprises me is I've been working for racial justice, you know, my, my entire life, and this is always something I've studied. And in the last few years, I've learned something about the depth of the cruelty of slavery and how this cruelty is once again being unleashed that I had no idea about and specific books that I would highly recommend and these are books that are as beautifully compelling as they are heart-wrenchingly painful. One of them is A Half Has Never Been Told by Edward Baptist and when I you know, started to read this book, I thought, well, I knew this, slavery and the making of American capitalism. I mean, I, I, I knew, I did not know. I did not know that the explosion in the cotton market was not just the cotton gin, it was systematic daily torture. And it was a brutality in which it was torture that was multifaceted. People could be greater workers if they were separated from their families and they were coffle gangs. They would walk 500 miles, families systematically divided. Uh, so to get to these plantations, it was constant violence. So for example, if what you could get was 150 bags of cotton and you only got 100 that day, you got lashed 50 times. I mean, the systematic Again, violence, excessive violence, and delight in violence. Also, another book that I'm just reading now is um, They Were Her Property. And it's a new book that white women, slave owners, were just as bad. Not only in the, in the use of enslaved people, but explicit violent brutality and also be known that whenever there was any kind of kindness, it was also strategic because it was making sure that um, you were better to get more out of you and your employment. And at any time you could be sold in this hideous tension where the only way white women could get any sense of independence because they couldn't own property once they were married, these complex legal systems where they could own enslaved people and they would fight to maintain that. And, and so this kind of ugh, disgusting independence of white women that was literally enacted on the bodies of um, African Americans, a third along the line. And what's interesting in reading this book, it's Carol Anderson, White Rage, um, because she takes it the next steps, because she begins with reconstruction up through what's happened with the new Jim Crow, the prison industrial complex, voter suppression. And when she wrote that book, um, Carol Anderson also thought at some level that there was a threshold below which we couldn't go. And the, and, the, and the book came out before this white rage has been unleashed again. But it's something that, that, that is white people. And one, one last thing I'd like to mention about this, Meg, when I gave a presentation to a humanist group oh, a couple of years ago, um, where I was talking about what I'd been learning uh, about the, the depth of white evil. And again, how and this is a thing that's... Um, I don't know yet a book that delves into this specifically, but everyone needs to be aware of it. There's this group now, Turning Point, that's going to college campuses all over the United States. And their effort is American exceptionalism and free markets. And um, they're really trying to explicitly raise, not just subtle white supremacy in your face, white ownership of um, the world. And, you know, one woman was there was saying, well, you know, all of that, that's just really white men. No, it's not. It is not at all. White women are as complicit in this. And I think it is absolutely essential that we understand where this comes from, what unleashes it, and what are the most effective forms of standing up to it. So uh, one thing I want to tell our viewers, we will make sure we get the names of those books right so that we can put them into the show notes. Um, so we'll, we'll get those for you. Um, but what, do, what good does it, because here people say to me all the time, I already know it's bad. It's too white people. It, and, and I'm not hearing you say that people of color necessarily should be reading, um, how cruel and horrible it was. What, what do you think it does for white people 
to face that history? What, well, especially what that now, you know, they used to people are able to say, well, that was then and say, uh-uh, honey, it's happening now. It happened in Charleston. It happened with Dylan Roof. It's happening in laws that are being enacted. It's happening in the explicit statements of our president. And so we can't pretend. Richard Spencer, who is um, one of the leaders of this movement, when he spoke, and this is one of the launching of their campus campaigns, um, it was at Texas A&M. It was right after the election. And I found out about this because my brother teaches at Texas A&M. And um, this is one of the first places they went because they thought they could really, you know, get people to support because they knew Texas A&M, it's a military school, more likely they voted for Trump. And when he spoke, um, he said, yeah, you know, basically he says, you know, white men, we conquered this continent. And the end of the day belongs to us. And so there is a white identity politics that is supporting, I'm a Proud Boys is one of the groups that is also supporting explicit violence. And so it's a kind of thing, it's happening now, folks. And I'll give you an anecdote that goes along with um, the facts. And I think if anyone pays attention, if you're in a college community, they're coming after your students. The thing with Turning Point too is their goal is to take over um, most student governments like within the next five years. And so they're putting money into student uh, government campaigns and doing it as an explicit counter to all of the multicultural education and community engagement that's being on. And one of the things that they're trying to get at is, yeah, it wasn't so what it was. So and again, Meg, what's different? They're not saying it wasn't bad. They're saying that's what it takes. So it's not in a sense like that's what's so horrible about this group. There's some who say, well, slavery wasn't that bad. This group is saying, well, yeah, so what? We're the rulers, this is what we do. Authoritarianism, simple, powerful, punitive, and let's do it again. And so we and, have- And are they succeeding on campuses with yeah, the government elections and everything? They are. And one of the reasons they're succeeding is, you know, most of the government elections, there's not any money behind it. You know, people don't do that. They just run, no, they're putting money. They're, they're, and one of the things I'm really, I've become involved uh, for many years because of the positive things they're doing for, uh, racial justice, environmental sustainability, and economic justice, the um, Engagement Scholarship Consortium. These are like over 100 colleges. They've changed their mission from teaching research to mutually beneficial community engagement. And so it's like using resources to really solve problems in a way that give people jobs and that are lasting. Well, those are the ones that Turning Point is really going after. And they're trying to get all these um, white students to say, well, you've been left out in the identity politics thing, you know? I know, and um, again, you should rule. It's fascinating. I was just having a, a conversation with some folks, I guess it was even just yesterday, about this growing sentiment um, among certain white people yeah. that um, they were like next in line uh, and now, because you know they conquered. I mean, it's 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 part of that whole ideology, right? We conquered this continent. We were the ones who were supposed to be in charge, and we were next in line. Mm -hmm. And now, these other people uh, want in on the power, um, and just how insidious that is. Uh, Insidious. And how we can get at it, Michael, because all of us know that power, but it's not a zero sum game, you know, that, 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 you know, there are things, there's enough to go around that we can share. I mean, one of the things I love, and Meg knows this work too, we talk about Robin Wall Kimmerer and Juliet Shore, like plenitude, you know, economies of belonging rather than belongings, right? And that it doesn't have to be as much money as you can, you can, you can get. Um, but, but what's happening here is they're, they're, they're really going into a sense of kind of a scarcity men, mentality. Power is not power with, power is domination. They were next in line. And um, I, I was speaking to a group of um, this master class or a group of humanist leaders um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and, and one of the things that they, that came out so important was the work, you may know Chris Stedman, um, a Meadville grad who wrote the book, Faithiest. And he says, as we as you use and we as humanists can't assume this is just 
conservative Christians. I mean, evangelical Christians are definitely supporting this, so much so that someone like David Gushy, um, who is evangelical Christian, said that white Christianity has become the worship of whiteness rather than the worship of Christ. But he's saying this is also within atheist and humanist circles. And um, in fact, the guy I was quoting before, Richard Bannon, is an atheist. And they're going specifically after young white men who feel like they don't really belong. How do they fit in? Where are they going to make a difference? And saying that the problem is you being in charge isn't taken for granted anymore and it should be. Well, and, you know, the, the conversation that I was having is even how those who are in power and um, th those who are leading this sort of white nationalist movement are preying upon uh, white folks who've been living in poverty, some for generations, and saying, well, you, you were going to be the next ones to be lifted out of poverty, and now you're not. Well, like, gonna, as, as if, as if that were, that were, were true. And, and also um, one of the things though, I think that it's really important, it's that group and more, I, I got into the, to the research. And one of the things that's really clear is that um, the people who voted for Trump and the Republicans who supported it actually have higher median incomes at 70,000 plus, but it's a sense of relative deprivation. They really don't want to share. I mean, you know, there is this kind of sense of wanting it to be um, a basic dominant group. And what turned out to be the, one of the things that was the metrics of whether people voted for Trump or Clinton uh, was either racial animus or racial resentment. And racial resentment is the more modest thing of, well, we're not taken for granted and racial animus, no, they're inferior and they're taking things away from us. And both of those are on the rise. Sharon, what is the class um analysis around who's drawn to this because I Michael was referencing poor it's white people but we know that the Trump voters were not it was not those poor white people nor nor is the white rage that Carol Anderson documents um, rage of people who are economically disenfranchised I I, I want to just lift up kind of the race class um, dimensions of this because to me that those outraged men, are often the most privileged people. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. right? <laughs> and so the way that I see it fits in with class is where you would think there would be a natural alliance. It prevents people from seeing it because they identify with their race privilege rather than their class. The same thing with gender. The fact that 53% of white women voted for Trump in spite of his explicit sexuality. And so it's, no, it's, it, it's, it's it, it crosses. What it really relates to, and this is one of the things that um, I'd like to, Let's see, share with you and see if we've got, yeah, time to do a little bit of an experiment because this gets at what's really driving it, okay, and where we can make a difference. And I think we need to make a difference in two ways. One, the research standing up to bullying, which is you do not cooperate with bullies, you call it, you name it, but also the kind of preventive work. Um, what I found so fascinating, and so the driver of this isn't class, it's a different sense of what it means to be part of cohesive, productive communities. It's the understanding of community and power within community. So the science. Um, one of the things that they found is that authoritarianism rises, and they were saying it's inevitable when there's more progress. And one woman, Karen Stinner, uh, was even saying that when you look at the science of democracy rather than the religion, we need to slow down the pace of social change. Well, I, I disagree, and I, I want to pose that we just do social change in a different way, okay? And then I, I'm going to give you the data that makes me think part of the problem is how we do the social change rather than needing to slow it down. Um, here is how people measure authoritarianism, and I'm going to ask you, and Meg has done this with me before, and I'm going to ask you to join it and then people watching it to think about this as well, is authoritarianism, they measure not just political views, they asked people about their child rearing values. And then those are correlated with political positions. So I want you to take just a couple of minutes, couple of minutes or just a minute and think, what to you are like four of the most important child rearing values? And write them down.
Okay, now what I'm gonna give you now is, um, there are two studies that are used, and this measures authoritarianism. Again, this is not just the United States, this is international. Um, and what they've done is they, this one scale is you have to choose between two different sets of values. And I'm gonna read these. And as I go through them, pay attention to see if there's anything that you mentioned that's left out, that's not on either scale. Okay, so here's the first one. This is Karen Stenner. These are the choices. Obey one's parents or think for oneself. Respecting elders or following one's conscience. Following the rules, exercising good judgment. Being well-mannered, being responsible for one's own actions. Being neat and clean or being interested in how and why things happen. And then there's another scale, and this is used by uh, Mark Hetherington and Jonathan Weiler. Either respect for elders or independence. Obedience or self-reliance. Good manners or curiosity. Well-behaved or considerate. So, do y'all think of anything that wasn't mentioned here? The the thing, uh, the first thing I wrote down when when you asked me to come up with four, um, and I think I can probably fit it into those those categories. If, um, but the first thing that I wrote down was consent, um, and part of. Part of you know where I come from with that is I'm raising someone who um, was assigned female at birth and who has confirmed that that she is indeed a girl in, in our society and um, I I am trying really hard for her to know that that she has to consent mm -hmm. uh, that her that her consent is important um, when you know when she's touched or you know whatever it is that uh that 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 so th it's very it's foundational to to how i'm trying and not always succeeding i, f I fail at my own values uh <laughs> to parent her um and so i think i can fit it into but it's not there michael the things but it's not exactly it's, it's not, not it wasn't exactly any of those categories no in, in reading the analysis around them no it's not there <laughs> yeah well i though i you've talked to me about this i didn't remember the specifics i mean the first thing i wrote was compassion yeah and um i don't see that anywhere in there and then kind of aligned with consent i wrote compassion self-respect respect for others and generosity and yeah. I don't really hear those in there too much. I mean, there's obedience, but I don't think that's respect for others necessarily. Um, you know, but but certainly I raised my kid to have good manners, you know, <laughs> because that's part of respecting others, right? So anyway. Well, you know, except, you know, and again, it's good that you mentioned that and open up to other people too, is things that they said is oppositional that maybe go together. I mean, because, you know, they say it's either well-behaved or considerate. Well, I was raised to be well-behaved because you're considerate, you know, because <laughs> you've got respect for others. It's not just you going into the world. Well, right? and that what well-behaved means is yeah. contextual. Exactly. <laughs> Does it mean just never say a word, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes uh, well, and, and this goes to what we started with, but sometimes well-behaved as a citizen means agitating for resistance and not complying, right. not complying with, with evil. Precisely. Um, Precisely. I'll just, I'll just say that somebody, uh, yeah. somebody online said, trusted love, patience, compassion, and boundaries. Exactly. Gloria or Dawn, what about you? One of the things that I had down was um, bouncing back from mistakes. So that's like a resilience, re mm -hmm. like helping scaffold resilience for children. I don't have children, just for a you know caveat to all of this, uh, but I was a teacher, so I'm drawing from that experience. Um, and I, I put safety in there, like a, a child rearing value for me is just to keep them safe. 
and that that can sometimes feel very authoritarian <laughs> in in like no <laughs> just so mm. yeah i i also don't have any children um and so i look at my list and i'm like that's really consistent with having pets um <laughs> In that I have patience and love and consistency and compassion. Yes. Right, which are all great if you're trying to train a dog. Um, um, and I imagine they're probably useful in raising children, um, but I have no authority to speak on that. <laughs> but, but you didn't hear Michael or me say that we actually did. <laughs> <laughs> So you yeah. can have values, whether well, or not you're always living them. Sadly, whether I and, always, I, and, I, and I want to push that. back too on the on the notion that it's only parents that have child rearing values, exactly. right? So you yeah. know, my kid's teacher is involved in yeah. the values that she's being raised in, and if I were not my kid's minister, her minister would be involved in the so you know the the religious education program at the congregation that she goes to. Um, is involved in the values that she's being raised with. And if they and didn't also, match my values, I wouldn't take her there. Well, also but, they draw the larger picture that what these reflect is what you think makes for a cohesive community. Yeah. In and what you think counts as the responsible use of power. And I've been doing this exercise, um, you know, all over the United States since 2016. And the things that you've named are the kind of things that are left out. And of course, things like... Um, Oh, kindness, cooperation, commitment to justice and fairness, things that are said in opposition really um, serve each other. Uh, one of the things I know, I was, I was very proud of both of my daughters. They're, they're now 29 and 32. And the 29-year-old, it gets into things that you were thinking, Lori, about learning from mistakes is she said honesty. And honesty, not meaning you criticize other people. Honesty, you acknowledge when you screwed up and, and, and make amends. Uh, my daughter Zoe, who's incredibly independent, she teaches not just yoga, but paddleboard yoga and groove three dance with yoga. And when I ask her respect for elders or independence, she just said, well, immediately respect for elders. I couldn't do what I'm doing without the elders who supported me. And the problem is, you know, this is the what's so fascinating about this research and where there are so many things that we can act is First of all, this data, it leaves out so much of what we've talked about. It also leaves out values that are held in African-American, Latinx, American Indian population, so much so that they leave those groups out of the data because they skew it. It doesn't get in. Another problem, what the political scientists then set up as our choices are either cohesive communities based on obedience, hierarchy, and rules, or freewheeling individualism. They don't get a sense of a different form of community. So it's like when we share resources and we share the wealth, it's a richer community. It's not though we as white people aren't in charge anymore. We as white people can belong in a different way. And so the challenge is not focusing what we have. It's not cohesive tribalistic communities, but expansive pluralistic communities. What does it mean to belong to a larger whole? And it means, and one, one of the things I think is so important about our work, and this is a thing of, when I read Gustavo Gutierrez in the early 1970s, I completely missed this. His classic te text, The Theology of Liberation, based on the resistance movements in Latin America. And we said the theology of liberation freezed the oppressed from their exploitation, their marginalization, and their alienation. The theology of liberation frees the oppressor, and it frees us from our isolation, alienation, and arrogance. And so that kind of statement of uh, what we're about in church is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable doesn't make sense. What we're trying to offer is a generative form of comfort for the comfortable, one that is deeper and wider and accountable, and it's a kind of vitality that can better serve us all. So, uh, you know, let's just be real that all of us who are doing this work in congregations find <clears throat> white people who don't want to be freed in those ways at all, and, and experience that not as freedom at all, but as taking something from them. So, um, yeah. 
you know, I just see us bending over backwards to try to comfort them that they're not losing something. And so I wonder in the book about white rage, mm -hmm. um, because you use that white rage too, let's be real. This isn't just white supremacist uh, organized movements. Uh, I hit white rage frequently talking to you use when I say anything, you know, with the fragility. So how, <clears throat> how do you see actually moving people towards that kind of liberation? <laughs> it only happens through action and not through conversation. Because if people haven't experienced a different way in the world, they're not going to see it. They can't imagine a richer form of belonging. And so um, two examples, it's much easier to do with children and young adults than it is for adults. And so I'm going to describe the research and what works with those. One of the things that's so important about this entire movement of engagement scholarship is that um, schools and then like in Penn State, for example, they want it with their 90,000 students in the next couple of years to where it's going to be a requirement is that students of all races and economic classes find more power and delight in working with diverse teams to solve problems. And that while it's harder to cohere at first, once you do better at solving problems, there's an intrinsic joy and delight. Another thing I remember it was interesting when I was giving a lecture on this at Southern Methodist University and um, one of the chaplains there, I mean, because Southern Methodist U University is basically a rich white kid school. And they were finding that uh, rich white kids would have an experience of doing this kind of real work with people rather than for people. Uh, finding that it completely changed. I mean, they didn't want to spend the rest of their life just making money and playing golf and collecting things. That this is a deeper, more joyful way of being in the world. Now, how do you get this to the challenges of um, people in our congregations who are so so, so stuck. And so they don't get this chance often to work with people. And, and so I really do think that is what really, I don't know easy answers, but it's finding out what are the forms of action. And an example, um, James Luther Adams wrote about this in one of his work, part of his work in Chicago, where he's working with someone in a congregation who really had a sense that, you know, people who are poor, they should basically solve it for themselves. And somehow he got him involved where it was really working with people who are poor and seeing what their lives were like and realize that's what changed his way of seeing things. There's a whole move now in the field of professional economic ethics that you don't come in and do um, development work unless you live for a period of time with the people that you're working with and testing things. And so I think our challenge is finding how there can be mutually beneficial ways of working together because unless that's been experienced People who have been a, have this isolation and alienation and arrogance, they have no idea what they're missing because they've never experienced it. Sharon, I'm really struck when you say that the theology of liberation, it does different things for the oppressor than it does for the oppressed. And one of the things you mentioned was that it frees us from, frees the oppressor from isolation. And that for me is a precursor to spiritual growth like connection is a, a key part of spiritual growth and healthy spiritual development and um i i was you know i'm i'm with allies for racial equity and we have this discussion group on facebook and one of the questions that was brought to our group the other day was about um you know how to respond to a congregation that was pushing back on a, a potential sermon topic for a guest pulpit that was about um, the black empowerment controversy and healing, you know, like exploring that, uh, confronting it and healing, you know, how, where do we go from here kind of stuff. And the congregation's response or the, you know, the people who were trying to, you know, engage this, this minister to come in said, you know, we're not interested in that. We're not really interested in racism. We're more interested in spiritual growth and drawing that dichotomy <laughs> between spiritual growth and and racism as like they're two separate things. I'm wondering how would you respond? Like, you know, how do we engage a congregation that says something like that to our well, minister? I'm wondering if, and again, this, this, this would be an experiment, okay? And, and this might get at um, to Meg a kind of resource that's necessary for, for you know, for, for getting people who, who don't want to, to look at this and, and, they, and they think that they're just fine because it's really, to encounter how bad things are 
is itself a spiritual challenge. And as you were saying, Lori, how important it is to admit that we've made mistakes. And so to look at it from a point of view of spiritual growth, how do we honestly see when there's been this huge divide between our intentions and our impact? And maybe one of the things I thought was interesting in, in Linda's um, Crossing Boundaries um, passport, which can, can be made, is that you, and so maybe you would start on stuff like that that isn't quite, quite in as big as the prison industrial complex, the school to prison pipeline, which is more things of when you've intended well and it's actually called harm. And what is the spirituality that allows you to be open to that and learn from it? And then looking at as a case in point, the black empowerment. And what does it mean to know this is likely to happen again? Um, I, I find one of the, the things that- or, la or last week in Unitarian Universalism. Precisely, it happened last <laughs> week, yes. And, and, and so we can find other things you know, where this happens. And again, it's one of the basic things where I love the work of Francis Peabody, Unitarian founded social ethics, but he acted as though intent was everything. No, it's not. It just gets you started. I mean, you, again, it's the attention to the impact. But again, not just as an intellectual, how do we spiritually hold that pain and honor fully? You meant to do the right thing. You know, and that happened in the, the you, your world. You, you, but you caused grave pain. And how do you, and, and how people see when that's happened to their lives and how they do it and then take that from the personal to the political. And that's a big part of what spirituality is about. I, um, <clears throat> um, Alex Capitan um, yeah. has a wonderful sermon that um, Z preaches about discomfort as a spiritual practice. Yes. And um, the congregation that I serve engaged Alex before they called me to do some basic understanding about gender stuff. And um, that's one of the things that Alex talks about on a fairly regular basis is, is um, our, our spiritual practice a lot of times we have this idea that it's going to lead us to this very peaceful cloud-like place where we are going to be enlightened and perhaps levitate. And instead, my understanding, and, and Alex and I have talked about this, is that um, the only way to expand my comfort zone is to continually step outside of it. Nice. Um, and God help us, but it's some kind of ugly some days. <laughs> when I step outside my comfort zone, I put my foot in something terrible. Um, <laughs> But I, I learned that the deepest, most powerful lessons I've ever learned in this world are from when I've done something well-intentioned and really awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but that's a, like framing discomfort and framing that, that personal anxiety associated with that as a tool for spiritual growth um, is deeply transformative, at least from what I've seen happen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll be quick with this on this time, is that, um, and, I, and she, she, she's agreed to make it available. So two things, this Crossing Boundaries Passport, a journey of discovery that Linda Sutherland created, does just that. You pick some kind of boundary, and this is a spiritual task. She says, this is spiritual practice. It says, I'm glad I did this because one hard thing was I learned. And then something that provides, and it's beautifully written, and this is becoming a favorite book for a lot of people, Robin Wall Kimmer of Braiding Sweetgrass. And it's practices, again, of expanding comfort. And the thing that she mentions is being attentive to our constitutive windigos, our particular forms of evil that do not go away. They remain, they have to be seen. And when we know that they're there, and it's a kind of the discomfort. We can check them in other people and we can check them in ourselves. Well, on that note, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Sharon. Oh, thank this you. Was a wonderful start to a lifelong conversation for those of us who are white and, and want to be, want to be liberated um, and want to be part of collective liberation. 
Next week, we'll have board members, our collective members, activists from Trust with us. Looking forward to that conversation, uh, talking about all kinds of things. And um, it's, it's been great. Thank you to those of you from all over the world. It was fun to have an international audience uh, asserting who you are. We will, once again, we'll get the names of all of those books and make sure to promote those uh, over on the page. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.